Um, so I'm Alex Bell. Um, I will be chairing this session. Um, first of all, please allow me to um, echo, uh, where's Frank on? Frank's respects to the country that we are on today. Frank is looking for Frank at the moment. At the right um, to echo uh, Frank's amazing um, acknowledgement of the country that we are on today, which um, for us in the room is Ngunnawal and Nambri, Nambri country. Um, and to pay my respects as well to the custodians of this land, um, past and present. So our next session is on accelerating renewables, which um, as we've seen from Frank's introduction is a critical part of the transition uh, that we find ourselves in the middle of. Um, I am part of a program at the ANU called the Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program, which using the acronym BISGIP, we, um, we actually do attempt to do a lot of these things, um, including working on what we call socio-techno-economic um, analysis and approaches to that energy transition. Um, so I'm really interested to hear from our four speakers today um, and about their perspectives and perhaps bring a little bit of our perspective to the conversation as well. So today we'll hear um, very brief remarks, five minutes each, real challenge. Good luck, everyone. Uh, from four speakers, Professor Carly Catchpole, um, Professor Liz Ratnam, Dr. Andrew Thompson and Tim Jordan, who hopefully we have joining us on Zoom. Um, this will be followed by a Q&A session where you'll have the opportunity to ask uh, questions about accelerating renewables in the room and online um, through the Q&A function. Just a reminder that today's session is being recorded as well, so keep that in mind, please. So let's begin. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Kylie Catchpole, um, who is a research leader and educator in the School of Engineering here at ANU. Um, her research focus is on renewable energy integration and the creation of a resilient future energy system, as well as solar cell technology. Professor Catchpole's group has achieved record efficiency perovskite solar cells, and their work on direct solar to hydrogen generation was listed as one of the top 10 innovations by the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum in 2020. Welcome to the podium, Kylie. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about accelerating renewables into the grid. Uh, and this is actually the most important part of the energy transition over the next 10 years. The energy transition involves very many different aspects, but in the up to the scale of 2030, then accelerating renewables into the grid is the most important thing that we can do. Uh, if you look at what we're actually doing at the moment, what we're doing is installing renewables globally. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see that in the slides in a minute. Um, but overwhelmingly globally, we're installing solar and wind uh, more than any other technology. Uh, so we're installing, in first place, we're installing uh, more photovoltaics than, than anything else. Uh, second, there's wind, but we're installing also at a high rate. And in subsequent places, uh, the, the fossil fuels. And so uh, globally, uh, more than 75% of new energy capacity that's being installed is actually renewable energy technology. Uh, so that's important to recognize. So uh, we have at the moment in, uh, in terms of generation around 3% solar, around 6% wind, but what we're installing at the moment is overwhelmingly solar and wind. And so they, this transition is unstoppable because these are the che cheapest technologies to install. Uh, right, so you can see in the slides there, this is what we're installing uh, each year over the past five years. You can see um, more solar than, than anything else. Uh, in second place, wind, uh, in minor places, gas and coal and various other technologies. But Overwhelmingly, solar and wind, in fact, um, over 75% of new energy capacity is renewable. Okay, so we'll just move to the next slide then. Uh, I want to re reiterate Frank's point here about the importance of solar and wind. So this is um, the International Energy Agency, the stated policies um, by 2030. 
23. Yes, I can't stay still long enough to speak into a microphone that's stationary. Um, so what you see uh, is solar and wind are, are dominating the decrease in emissions. So this is in very important to recognize what's gonna turn us around by 2030 is solar and wind. So accelerating renewables into the grid is the most important thing we can do in the next 10 years. So that's really important to recognize. We have to do lots of other things as well. We have to get started on lots of other things, but most importantly, we have to make sure this accelerating renewables into the grid actually happens. Uh, the amounts here, solar is projected to reduce emissions by three gigatons of carbon dioxide by 2030, which is about equal to the emissions from all the cars on the road today. So that's also a useful figure to keep in mind. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please. So we have to do lots of things to actually make this work. So um, Frank showed us some, some pictures of uh, what solar and wind look like in the grid now. And at the moment, um, there's coal also and gas also in the mix. This shows you what it could look like in the future. So this is modeling a 100% renewable energy mix. Uh, and what you see is that, and this is actually modeling it during a very challenging period for Australia. We're in June um, when there's less solar and where there's less wind and there's higher demand. So if you look at how it all balances, these are some of the things that we need to do. We need to have plenty of solar, we need to have plenty of wind, but we also need to have quite a lot of interconnection, lot, plenty of transmission to make it all work. Uh, and we also need some kind of long-term storage. And this is something that we do need to make sure that we get moving on. Uh, if you look at the AEMO integrated system plan, then the role uh, projected for that is gas. If we don't want to have gas in the system, then we need to have something else um, that can provide that long duration storage. Uh, for example, pumped hydro. Just move to the final slide. Okay. So firstly, here are my conclusions. I only have five minutes. Uh, the transition to renewables is unstoppable and accelerating renewables is the most important thing that we can do in the near term. The progress we've seen so far uh, in Australia is um, moving towards transmission expansion. That's very necessary and that's starting to happen. Uh, the com capacity investment scheme is also very important in that it's encouraging renewables and storage at the same time as we're putting in the transmission. You really don't want to wait for one thing to happen before you're doing the other thing. So we need to do these things in parallel. Uh, going forward, there are still some pieces of the puzzle that are missing. Uh, and in my view, this is long duration storage, actually making sure that that's happening because it's going to take uh, some time to develop. So we can't wait for that. Uh, another thing is there's a lot of consumer solar already installed. There will be more consumer batteries already installed. We need to make this a win-win for consumers and for network providers to actually orchestrate those resources and make them work for everyone. Uh, and finally, this is a big space and there's lots to figure out. It's hard to understand what will work and what won't. Uh, and so we need much more modeling to better understand the risks and opportunities to understand uh, what will work what may not work, uh, de-risk those and allow investment to increase. Thank you, and I'll pass on to you. That was amazing, Kylie. Thanks so much. Uh, next we'll hear from Dr. Elizabeth Ratnam, uh, who leads a research group in power systems and optimization focused on theoretical and practical aspects of controlling renewable and distributed energy resources within power grids. Apologies for reading that, but my goodness. Um, so Dr. Ratnam currently holds a Future Engineering Research Leader Fellowship at ANU and is a Senior Lecturer at the ANU School of Engineering. She is a Senior Member of the IEEE and a Fellow of Engineers Australia. Welcome to the podium, Liz. Thanks, everyone. It's um, great to be here today. Uh, and my slides are working. My, oh, yes. Wonderful. Okay. So I'd like to start with a short overview. So what was the first thing that you did this morning? For me, I turned the lights on. Today, most of our electricity comes from burning coal at a power station. So when we turn these lights on, we indirectly emit carbon pollution, which contributes to climate change, a serious threat to our environment. In response to climate change, many governments around the globe are subsidizing homeowners who install rooftop solar. In Australia, we have the feed-in tariff, where customers 
are paid for the solar electricity they produce. Now imagine you install rooftop solar and you go to work and it's a nice sunny day, so your solar panels are doing a great job, but no one's at home using your solar electricity. And all of your neighbors, they're at work too, so they aren't using your solar electricity. So where does your solar energy go? Unfortunately, if no one's using your solar electricity, the energy you produce will be wasted. That is, the excess energy will be dissipated as heat. But there is an alternative. In my research, I've designed what I call the green box, which determines whether your rooftop solar is stored in a battery, is used to turn your lights on, or is fed back into the grid for all of your neighbors to use. So instead of your um, battery charging up, as soon as your rooftop solar becomes available, becoming full by about 11 o'clock in the morning, like my Tesla Powerwall, instead, my green box carefully controls the battery charging so as to prevent the waste of solar electricity. And I developed the first version of this green box in 2013, two years before the Tesla Powerwall hit the market. And since then, I've been evolving it. For example, in cases of widespread power blackouts caused by natural emergencies, I've designed the green box to keep the lights on along the street. I've also designed the green box to support electric vehicle charging, new market mechanisms, and any kind of communication infrastructure and importantly, to reduce the need to build more poles and wires along the street. To design this green box, this is where the science gets interesting. I use a science of mathematical optimization, which removes the need for simple rules that tell the battery to charge when rooftop solar is available. And instead, through the science, I can minimize your electricity bill, subject to your battery state of charge constraints, preventing the waste of solar electricity. Importantly, through the science of feedback control, I'm now designing these green boxes to play nicely with one another so as to prevent the occurrence of widespread power blackouts. For example, in 2003, there was a widespread power blackout across the east coast of the US, which cost the economy upwards of $7 billion. More locally in South Australia, in 2016, there was a power blackout across the state of South Australia, which cost our economy upwards of $300 million. With my green box publicly available to everyone, this never need to happen again. Okay, so now I'd like to talk a little bit um, about the um, energy transition as we've heard a little bit um, about today and some of the new research that's coming and the capabilities and capacities that we have in the School of Engineering. So as you mostly already know, uh, more than half of the world's coal-fired power plants will be retired in the next 15 to 20 years. And in fact, actually, Australia um, is relying on a, and more than 50% of their energy from coal, including black and brown coal. And so um, more than half of our coal power plants will be retired, um, is approximately about two thirds, if we follow the um, AEMO integrated system plan. And so what does that mean in terms of, um, uh, we, we've got this amazing opportunity to, to fill the gap of that um, coal powered generation with rooftop solar um, PV. And so if you look back in 2010, Australia had about a gigawatt of installed solar capacity um, with our population now around 25 million. That one gigawatt has now gone to about 30 gigawatts. And if we look at that at a, a kilowatt per person metric, um, that's about 1.2, which translates to each person in Australia owning about four solar panels. Um, and if we look just a couple of years ago, that was just two panels. So this transition is rapid and it's happening quite quickly. And we're actually leading the way globally, as you can see through this kilowatt metric um, with Japan, the US and Germany. Okay, and so if we install um, rooftop solar, we need to, to back that solar. So for example, in the, the night when the solar isn't producing any energy, we can install battery storage. And through my research, I've showed the savings can be about $2 a day for a customer with rooftop solar. And if they install a battery, those savings could be up to $4 a day if they did nothing to help the grid, but if they did help the grid as well, the savings are comparable at about $2 a day. So this sort of like, you know, prompts the question of like, what are the right policies? But there's definitely an economic um, value in installing battery storage um, today. And so what, what if we looked at the same sort of analysis, but with, instead with electric vehicles? And so um, again, with a very small um, solar array, a, a, a typical residential customer consumes about 20 kilowatt hours a day. If that customer installed a, an electric vehicle, instead of two or $4 a day with the standard smaller 10 kilowatt hour battery, with an electric vehicle battery, um, they could save upwards of $8 a day. That saving somewhat depends on where they're located in the grid. Um, and there's a fairness question about that that we're also addressing. 
But the takeaway is that there is substantial savings um, to be had for customers installing electric vehicles. And the size of an electric vehicle battery is much, much larger than a standard household battery, which provides us opportunities to think um, even bigger again in terms of the energy transmission, uh, transition and transmission grids. So that's what I'd like to sort of introduce today, um, some of our new research in this space. So in the energy transformation, can we interconnect renewable energy zones um, in a way that we don't need to build um, as much as we're predicting um, transmission towers. So if you look at the AMO ISP, it says um, that we need something in the order of 10,000 new kilometers of transmission networks, so new transmission corridors, new power lines, in order to connect all of these renewable energy zones and accelerate this transition and allow us to electrify everything. And so the question we're asking is, can we actually build less transmission lines? and also maintain the grid stability doing that. And the question or the answer that we're looking to do that is with giant batteries or aggregating all of these electric vehicle batteries together. And so the science that we're using to do this is negative imaginary systems theory that lets us look at robustness. And with that science, we can actually unlock the full capacity of existing transmission lines. And if we built more or new transmission lines, we would actually unlock more capacity in those as well. So we don't have to actually build as big, bigger transmission lines. So the answer, I guess, to, to the energy transmission is we can build things bigger, we can build more transmission lines, or maybe we can think about doing things smarter with control theory, for example. And so the benefit um, in doing this is that we can speed it up. So for example, if we build a new transmission line corridor, it could take two to three years at least in just getting all of the easements and the approvals and the environmental um, regulation to do that. As we've seen with the Tesla big battery, um, it was in the order of 100 days or less. And so we can speed up this energy transition. Okay, and so to test and prove all of this new science, all these new concepts, um, we've been awarded from the Australian Research Council and National Facility for electric grid and security and resilience research, which I'm in the process of building. Um, so this facility looks at not only the physics of the electric grid, so electromagnetic transient um, behavior, phasor domain behavior, but also overlaying the communication infrastructure that we have in existing grids today, and then overlaying the operational technology, for example, control technology. And then on top of that, overlaying the cyber physical system. And so there we can look at really the resilience of the full power system end-to-end, -end, um, subject to, for example, cyber attacks. But also what's really important about this facility is that it allows us to test these new control methods, for example, these smarter methods, to allow us to verify this proof of concept before we go and deploy it in the field. Do I have one more slide? Okay, no, I think that's the last one. Um, so thank you everyone for your time and I look forward to the panel session later on. Thank you. Dr. Andrew Thompson, uh, Director of Market Operations at Squadron Energy, um, where he plays a key role in managing the company's renewable power purchase agreements and environmental certificate trading. Um, additionally, he provides strategic support to various departments within the organisation through the Energy Markets team. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Look, I thought I had to jump in and just introduce Squadron Energy really quickly. Um, so uh, thanks for having me here. But Squadron Energy, we're a, a developer of renewable energy projects. Um, we build, own and operate them. And so we have 1.1 gigawatts of uh, wind farms over the national electricity market and, design, and designs on 20 gigawatts by 2030. So we're a company that's uh, highly invested in accelerating renewables. We want to be part of that solution. Um, and, you know, I, I was really honoured to be asked to come here and, and talk to you about, you know, what, what we're doing. Um, but I also found it really daunting, uh, the fact that I had to come in here and talk to you about accelerate, accelerating renewables. Uh, like, I can completely echo the thoughts of the previous speaker that this is something that we, it's an absolute imperative, and I think I'm probably uh, speaking to the converted. But, you know, accelerating and giving a, you know, a pithy answer in five minutes on how we do that is, is, is impossible. It's really really hard um, and for me it feels like 
you know, in our business, we're not accelerating. It's really hard. Uh, and, 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 and so instead of talking about accelerating them, at least to start off, I'd like to talk about what do we need to do to maintain our, our license to operate? And that is absolutely critical. So we, we need to think about the three C's. Well, I've come up for you is, uh, is, is the three C's. And so we really need to think about the consumer and, and, and how do we do that? We do that by, by delivering the lowest cost of energy. And it's not just energy when we want to produce it, it's energy when you need it. Okay, so it's firmed energy. Um, and I'm really happy if we could have a carbon tax and bring in carbon pricing, because that would be really advantageous to our business model, but that's not the political system that we have currently. So I, I, you know, I'd, I'd love triple bottom line accounting on this, but we don't have it. But we still need to keep that squarely in our sights. And the reason why we need to keep that squarely in our sights is that we are absolutely getting torn down by the media uh, for potentially not delivering on you know, our plans to deliver the lowest cost of energy to the consumer. So if we cannot keep that in the forefront of our minds, uh, we're always going to be chasing our tails and fighting a losing battle. The second C is uh, coordination. And I think we've seen, you know, amazing steps um, by the federal government towards us, particularly with, with the capacity investment scheme, which was announced last week. But these things had to start somewhere and the coordination, a lot of it started here in the ACT, or I think some of the big efforts. So we're really thankful as a company uh, to the ACT government for their um, power purchase agreements, because that gave Squadron Energy's Genesis, um, uh, Sapphire Wind Farm, one of its first contracts. And, and, and it's probably the reason why I'm standing here to you today presenting to you. So it, coordination is key. And uh, coordination, it's great when it starts at the top, but you know, it needs to flow down to all the other governments, um, at state level and also local councils. If we can't coordinate the transition, then it's gonna be really hard to accelerate it. My third C is community. And I, I don't mean us here, like we're all part of the renewable energy community, I hope, or many of you will be, but I mean the communities that we, um, we, 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 uh, we operate our projects, okay? Now, all of our projects, um, you know, say for maybe a few batteries uh, or peaking generation plants, they're gonna be built in remote communities. Why? That's where the energy resource is the best. Um, that's where we're, we're impacting the least amount of people. And it's also where we can usually, relatively easily connect to the transmission network. So that's why we operate in these communities. And when it comes to our, you know, our direct landowners, great. We have, a, we have an agreement with them. We have a, a, a lease with them and that's fantastic. They, they love us, we get on really well. The neighbors we usually get on pretty well with because we make sure that they're compensated for any inconvenience and, and, and uh, you know, impact that they might have. But those surrounding the wind farms, they sit there and go, hey, I'm the consumer sort of, my bills are going up, but what am I getting, okay? So that's really important for us too. So we, we you know, have a gamut of programs and I'm happy to talk more about them uh, to support, uh, you know, engagement in the community and, and, and hopefully, you know, we'll have a lot more to announce, to, to announce soon. So those are my three C's and, and, and I think we need to be, you know, keeping these firmly in our mind to maintain our license to operate. And when it comes to uh, accelerating renewables, it, it, it really comes down to execution. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go well over, but I think that's probably all right. Um, so uh, if I could switch point in the wrong direction, so that's probably why. Can you click me on one, please? Thank you. So a couple of speakers have talked about um, the integrated system plan and AMO's integrated system plan. It's a great acronym. Probably started in 2018 from the Finkel Review, I'm pretty sure. Um, and what the um, Australian electricity market operator do, AMO, is they collect a whole bunch of inputs and they sort of solve, uh, they solve how we can roll out our, our energy system, how we can evolve the energy system. And just like me, uh, which I love, they're solving for the lowest price of energy to the consumer for, the reli for a reliable system. Uh, and actually just recently for the next ISP, they'll also be looking, bringing carbon into that accounting. So I think that's great too. So AMO are constantly looking at it. They update it every year, trying to figure out where we should go. And uh, it's really key because we talked about transmission lines before. This is how we, this is how we, um, we, we, we just justify a, a regulated mon monopoly. Transmission networks are regulated monopolies. We're not uh, a transmission network business. So that, that's how we decide which transmission project will and, and won't go ahead, go ahead. And if you can read about it, I strongly recommend you do. But the, the task that we have ahead of us to, to reach our goals by 2030 is roughly 20 gigawatts of wind, 15 gigawatts of rooftop PV, uh, four gigawatts of utility scale, uh, 15 gigawatts of uh, storage. And 
just to give you an idea of, of what that might mean, we, we shared some, uh, a little number with Chris Bowen last year, and he's been using it a bit, which I really like. And that is that, you know, to meet our goals by 2030, we need to be installing 40 wind turbines a month. Currently, we're at 15. So we certainly, you know, need to ramp up a lot. And that's where, you know, accelerating is critical. Um, and one of the things I would like to say to you guys, and we're obviously quite pro-solar, and, you know, we're very pro-solar too. Um, but at the moment, prices are regularly negative in the middle of the day in sunlight hours. Now, that just means that there's a strong market signal that, hey, right now I don't need any more energy. That's not the case every day, and it's not the case in winter, and it's not the case in the peak of summer. Uh, but certainly in the shoulder seasons, it's something that we're going to see more and more. And it's quite a challenging aspect of the market to deal with. Our PPAs no longer work, most of them, uh, when prices are negative. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we're going to see in the network is that historically, we've always had our peaks in energy prices in the summer. When everything is humming, everybody's turning electricity, uh, the air conditioner on, that's when things break down. Uh, the power output of every generator dives off a cliff when you get above 40 degrees. That's what's been challenging for us. In the future, we're going to have so much rooftop PV out there. We're not actually going to have a power problem anymore. We're going to have an energy problem, and it's going to happen in winter. And we've seen it happen over the past two winters. So how do we get around this? Well, seasonal storage, great. Um, Florence, she's still stuck in a hole. Um, so you know, what, what are we going to do about it? You really can't store energy that effectively over multi-months. Tell me I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, electricity is very hard. Uh, it's very hard to make your rate of return that you need on your projects to do it. You can do it. It's just financially, do you want to do it? There's better ways of doing it. Wind is great. It tends to blow more at night. And if you get the right side, it can blow more in the winter. So that's why wind is absolutely critical to this transition. I know I'm saying that. I'm going to say that. I'm from a wind company, but hopefully you're convinced. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can accelerate and get there. Now, I get on to the next one. So accelerating wind, as, I, as my thesis is, that we need to accelerate wind. It's a critical part of our electrification rollout. There, there is no panacea for this. I mean, I, I wish there was. Um, like coordination, it's the three Cs. Coordination with the government is going to help a lot. But, you know, we're focusing as a company on what we can do. And, and that is, you know, how can we transport and deliver our components better? In Queensland, every single uh, wide load that goes from the port to site needs to be accompanied by a police escort. A police escort. Now... There are plenty of people out there that can drive cars just as well as the police, okay? Or, you know, so a little bit of training, a little bit of TAFE, a couple of programs we can get there. It'd be better, okay? Uh, that's one thing we could do, but it's, that's not it. We're going to have to do these a hundred times over, a thousand times over. The logistics and how we lift these are really challenging, okay? So there's only about eight cranes that can build a turbine in the country at the moment, okay? Koala cranes are fantastic. They sound really cool. They climb up the, up, up the, uh, up the stubs of the turbine. So, you know, we're, we're looking at implementing those across our fleet. Community engagement and landowner relations, I mean, it's just a, a non-negotiable, like otherwise we, we, there will be no rollout of wind. Um, great solutions there that we'd love to talk to you about further in detail later on. How we interact with the grid is going to be critical at the moment or probably previous to now. Utility scale uh, renewable projects have really been a burden on system security. I, it's hard to say that out loud, but you know, inverter-based systems are not the same as synchronous machines. Uh, with the advent of grid forming inverters, they can be. So that's going to be one you know, great aspect for new renewable energy projects going forward. And simply how we staff uh, this transition is just going to be massively challenging. So while I've talked about all the challenges we have, I think maybe I'd like to reflect just one more on my false notion that we needed to do 40 turbines a month that we shared with Chris Bowen and, and we're not getting. Um, human beings are really, really bad at forecasting their abilities in a year um, because we tend to miss it. But we're actually bad at, focusing, at, at forecasting our abilities in five years' time, okay? So five years' time are where we can start to put together exponential growth. So I think that's the, that's the, that's the part of it which gives, gives me hope and, and hopefully you've uh, got some ideas there for how we will accelerate and continue to accelerate the renewable energy transition. Thanks very much, Andrew. That was super interesting, but I will have to deduct some points for time, I think. <laughs> Finally, we have Tim Jordan on Zoom. Hi, Tim. 
Um, Tim is a commissioner at the Australian Energy Market Commission and an economist who has worked on the energy transition in management, consulting, banking and government. Tim has more than 15 years experience across corporate strategy, clean energy investment and public policy. So we're really excited to welcome Tim. Thanks, Alex. Thumbs up on, uh, on you can see me and hear me. I'm going to take it you can and you'll let me know if it's not working. Look, it's great to be with you today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Thanks for bearing with me on Zoom. I've got back-to-back uh, -back commission meetings here in Sydney today. Uh, but I'm keen to talk because accelerating renewables onto the grid is very timely, uh, especially in light of last week's announcement from the Fred, federal government. I wanted to talk very briefly in my five minutes about two parts of the AEMC's work program, one on transmission, I've just heard just heard from Andrew about the importance of that. Another one on integrating consumer energy resources, which has been another theme that uh, the panel's touched on. And that's so we can take full advantage of all that PV and the coming wave of electric vehicles. I want to start with a little bit of scene setting. I think you've, 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 uh, you've probably all got a pretty good sense of where we are in the transition, but I, I like to think of us as being mid-transition in the electricity sector. Um, that means that at the moment, fossil fuels are coexisting with renewables. This chart shows the 25 years of the NEM. So it, it turns the NEM turns 25, uh, I think, next month. And what we what we see, you know, if we've shown generation by source, uh, is that we've uh, we're at about 30, nearly 40 percent renewables at the moment. But and that's a big change from just just a decade ago when it was only about 14 percent. Would we say that renewables and fossil fuels are cohabiting comfortably uh, in the mid transition? Um, well, I think we'd say mostly, but it's a bit complicated at times. In any case, the transition rolls on. You can see the, the very clear direction of travel. But where are we going? Well, we've just, we've just heard now again about the integrated system plan, but we look at that as the roadmap for our transition. Uh, two things to note on this slide. One is that the ISP is telling us that by 2050, we're going to have a much bigger market today uh, than, than today, just simply enormous growth in renewables and storage, nearly a quadrupling of nameplate capacity. And then on the right though, you see we'll end up with a very different mix of capacity in 2050 compared to today. You see, just, just glancing at the colors, you'll see the really different, the different mix that, that the market will, will, uh, will have to work with in 2050, including a huge role for distributed assets. That implies hundreds of billions of dollars of CapEx and you know, 10,000 kilometres of new transmission, though if Elizabeth is right, there might be might be less than that. But anyway, that's what the 2022 ISP says is required. Um, an update is going to come out from AEMO, I think, uh, as soon as next month. So we'll get a, we'll get a, a view on the ab absolute up to date view on the future quite soon. But this is the this is the this is what we're working towards. So with that context, I'll just talk to, uh, briefly about two areas that we're working on to accelerate renewables onto the grid and keep the transition moving. First of all, we're rewriting the rules on transmission investment. There's going to be tens of billions of dollars in, in investment just in transmission, more than likely, to add you know, probably 10,000 kilometres of, of poles and wires to the grid, though less if Elizabeth is right about batteries. Um, We've done a review of transmission planning and investment to understand how to get new connections, new, new augmentations to that network funded and built in a timely way. And we found that there were obstacles to getting it built, including uh, challenges on, on the financeability of projects, challenges on, on social license, which Andrew just mentioned. So we've made a set of recommendations that we think will, will address some of these obstacles while protecting consumers. Um, we think we found a big, a big opportunity to make the integrated system plan into the main planning tool for transmission networks. It's not that yet. It's a very useful model and a guide, but it's not yet the main planning tool. We think we can do more there. We're going to make some changes to improve early engagement on social license, because we know how incredibly important that is to, to uh, getting community buy-in to the transition. We want to make sure that that huge amount of CapEx is financeable, so when, when the networks go to borrow to, to fund this investment, that they can do that at rates that, that protect consumers. And we want to make sure that where the government's giving concessional finance to projects, that the benefits of that are going where it's intended. So it's just, that's, a, that's a snapshot of some of the things we're doing on transmission. But for us, trans, unlocking 
uh, the next wave of transmission investment is, is critical. But then, of course, customer energy resources are going to play a really crucial part in the transition. We've got one of the world's highest uptakes of solar PV. One in three households have solar panels. And by 2050, on AEMO's system plan, a third of all renewables is going to come from household solar. This has got big benefits. It can reduce the need for large-scale generation, can help us manage fluctuations in supply and demand if it's well integrated, uh, and it, we think it offers some big uh, economic benefits for avoiding avoiding additional uh, you know, unnecessary reinvestment in networks. But it also presents some challenges. You've got lots and lots of small-scale assets, and households want to have control over those assets. Uh, so they, we, we need those assets to be integrated, but we also have to recognise that households uh, are going to want to know the state of charge. They're going to want to know that they can call on those assets when they when they need them. So it's got to be changes that benefit all consumers, and it's got to be changes that benefit all consumers, not just those with PV. So that's another, another challenging, a, a big challenge for us to grapple with. So some, some of the things we're doing here are in, introducing flexible trading, so having uh, allowing multiple assets to be managed separately on a site, potentially build separately. Uh, to unlock value for consumers. We want to improve the visibility of consumer devices in market processes. We've got to make sure that all these devices are complying with technical standards because there's millions of devices that, are, that, that need to behave in a predictable way. So we've got to boost compliance. And, we really, and to really unlock this, we need smart meters in every home. So we're accelerating the rollout of smart meters. So across transmission and investment, there's two big areas that we're working on to accelerate, accelerate the rollout. And this is without mentioning everything we're doing in system security, in the ex exit arrangements for coal-fired power stations, uh, for transmission access reform, for market price settings, and many, many other things that it's going to take. Uh, reform is going to be needed to, uh, to manage the transition. But I thought they'd be two useful things to, to give you a sense of, and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I'd now in, like to invite our panellists back up to um, answer some questions. Um, so I might take this one because I've got the question pad. Um, the usual reminder that we're keen to get through as many questions as possible. So if you could keep them nice and short and with a question mark at the end. Um, I will get us started with one or two perhaps um, while we type the, um, the others in the chat and then there'll be some roving mics as there were in the first session. Um, we might get the big one out of the way first, the capacity investment scheme. Is it going to do what it says on the box or do we need more? Uh, so, I'll, I'll start. yeah, just give it a tap. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the capacity investment scheme is is a very important step in, in the right direction. Um, you've, can see um, just how much we investment we need out to, to 2050, but its capacity investment scheme is going to uh, help a lot um, in that in that short to medium term. The most important thing it will do is actually get things going um, and and provide uh, security for for investors um, while also capping costs. So both important features of the scheme, and these things will happen at the same time as we're rolling out all these uh, transmission. So we're not waiting for the um, for the price signals which would be require the extra transmission we're actually doing things straight away anything to add no no microphones here oh. <laughs> thanks Alex look I think that it's not clear what uh, exactly I mean it, it, look we're, we're, we're really happy with the Altezas and the program that energy Co has been running uh, so yeah I think it'll be a huge step in the right direction it's still very early days but there will be lots of time for them to sort of rework where they're going so yeah, it's a good step. Um, it kind of, they, anyway, the, the guidance that they, they announced aligned a lot with some of our submissions, so we, we were really happy with it. Yeah. Um, well, we may go to one in the um, on, on from the online, and then in the audience, um, we've got a couple as well coming out. Um, one for Kylie: Should we be putting more emphasis on community energy and storage? in order to reduce the need for transmission lines? That might be also a Liz question as well. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yes, well, we should do uh, what we can do to reduce the need for new transmission lines just because uh, transmission is slow to build. Uh, so this is one of the things that we need to take account of in the energy transition is that some technologies are fast and some are slow and solar and batteries are fast. They're fast to install. They're also reducing in price. So we should use them everywhere we can. Uh, certainly you need a, a, a large amount of transition as uh, transmission any rate. So we, we need to do that. Uh, but there's lots of scope uh, to increase the use of consumer energy resources. They need, um, as, as Tim was saying, they need to be orchestrated. They need to be managed. They need to do that in a way that consumers want to want to sign up for it. Uh, and at the moment, that hasn't, it's assumed in the AMO integrated system plan that that will happen, but the mechanisms to make it happen are still under development. So that very much needs to happen. Um, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, this is super exciting research that we've been doing presently. And so um, if we look at the transmission grid, um, the, the maximum energy we can, can release in that um, is determined by the, the rotor angle position, as well as the thermal limits and the voltage limits, for example. And, and that angle position um, determines stability. And so typically we operate transmission lines around 20 degree angle. Um, and when we start to get above that, the, the risk of losing synchronization in the grid and destabling the grid um, increases. And so what we usually do is invest in more transmission lines. Um, our research has shown that we can actually go up to an angle of 90 degrees with battery storage, which completely unlocks so much capacity. And so then we're thinking about thermal limits and voltage limits. And there's some really great research coming out of UC Berkeley where they're looking at new kinds of conductors that will allow us to push a whole lot more power down existing transmission lines. So if thermal limits are resolved and we can resolve rotor angle limits with battery storage, then it comes down to voltage limits, which I also think we can resolve with battery storage. And so there is a huge opportunity to completely rethink how we control and op operate our power system um, through battery storage that, that is really like cutting edge research just coming out. Um, and before we could never really think about it, right? We didn't have energy storage. We didn't have these giant batteries to enable it. And so I'm really excited and I, <laughs> on this research and I hope it actually translates to us, you know, not building more infrastructure than we needed. I, I, I came from, you know, Ausgrid when we we're building Smart Grid, Smart City and there was a whole narrative around us, you know, building out extra equipment in the 2010s, for example, and gold plating the grid. I really don't hope, I really hope that narrative doesn't transpire again and that we think about ways to do this intelligently. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Really interesting answers. Um, Genevieve, I think we have a question in the audience. Just yeah, we'll come here and then we'll go to Ken later on. Hi, Tim, I've just got a quick fact check question. In your graph that show the various contributions of the different types of energy going forward in gigawatt or kilowatt hours, it shows hydro as declining, and I was wondering why that was, and what happens if Snowy 2 ever comes on? <laughs> Good question. So in my, the version I'm looking at has, has hydro growing over the period, including, including with, uh, with Snowy coming in. I, I hope we're talking about the same chart. Uh, I, look, I think... Long duration storage is going to be an incredibly important part of the of the transition. It, it's, it goes to helping manage the really you know the, the risk of combined wind and solar droughts, which we, we you know we, we expect to be a feature of the of the future of the future system. Um, getting the investment signals right for pumped hydro is very challenging. That's something we we recognise. It's not obvious that the market, any kind of market settings are going to are going to. Uh, be enough to incentivize pumped hydro. So I guess what we observe is, you know, governments taking the lead on on building these assets. The very large capex that you have to recover over a very long time, and it seems that at the moment it's really only governments who've got that kind of um, investment horizon. Uh, and yet, once they've built their lovely assets to have in the system, and they and they last a long time. Um, so I, you know, I, my, my private view is it's 
it will will very much value having having snowy when it's built. <laughs> it's got a it, you know it's it, it's a challenge. Obviously, building these very large assets in a in a in a time when there are supply chain constraints, there are lots of other infrastructure investments going on around the country. Thank you, Tim. Um, I will go to another one online, and then Genevieve we might hear from Ken. Um, so for Andrew and others, question mark, um, there was an article on ABC Online today by author Nadia Daly titled Community Pushback Against Renewable Energy Projects Could See Australia Miss Its Emissions Targets and Climate Goals. What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, look, uh, absolutely true. If, if we, if, as I said, if we don't maintain the three Cs, we won't be able to continue what we're doing and and, and sort of and grow the transition. Uh, that's it. You know, we're working really hard. We've got a whole bunch of schemes that I'll try and spook. But you know, what we're what we're looking to do is making sure that within 20 kilometres of any of our projects, you're going to have uh, world-leading internet connection and 5G. So uh, we've got some ag tech programs going around our site. These are the types of initiatives which are kind of thinking out of the box and trying to leave our sites and and our operations um, better off than when we started. But let's just take the counterfactual for a second here. What 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 does it mean for you, the consumer, if if we don't maintain the social license of, of the communities where we, where we build, own, and operate? It means a higher price of electricity. That's that's what it means. It means that Australia, it's a diffuse cost to the many, and it makes us less competitive on a global scale. What it means is um, offshore wind, uh, a lot of offshore wind, and uh, connect cables direct direct to sort of Sydney and Melbourne. And and you know maybe that's not the worst connection. That's not the worst set up in the, the entire world, but um, it will be you know three times the cost. So I think as a nation, we should all figure out how to move together. And that means that you are having conversations with your relatives, your friends and your families, and, and you are moving that forward. Because we can only do so much with you know, our developers, our time and our dollars. It, 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 you know, and, yeah, we, we, we will do as much as we can, but, but we need you know, to build the community sentiment around how we move these, these projects forward. I just want to go one more point, so I'm going to wrap it on too long, but um, rooftop solar and home batteries won't save us. That's a third of our demand. So you can easily meet your own supply. Yes, you, your family, but no, you, no, you can't. The food that you produce, um, the products that you consume, the products that we export, okay? So that's roughly two thirds of our demand. And, and so we need utility scale renewables, uh, whether you like it or not. And we need um, transmission if we're going to be an economic superpower. So um, yeah, look, uh, we have to do it smart. We are trying to do it smart. These solutions we need, but we still need a lot of poles and wires and a lot of wind turbines and a lot of solar panels. Any response from the rest of the panel? We just let that one. <laughs> okay. We have a question from Ken, I think. Thanks very much. This is a question probably more for Tim, but I'd be interested to hear the other panel members view. Uh, Ken Baldwin from ANU, Tim. So, one of the things that <clears throat> seems to be decelerating rather than accelerating the energy transition at the moment is uh, is the social license of, of transmission. And uh, and we've he heard of this uh, many times, including to Andrew this afternoon. Um, so it strikes me that the wind uh, farm development group have got the, the social license issue uh, at, at, at more or less state-of-the-art gold standard levels now. And yet somehow we can't seem to do this with transmission. Is this because compulsory acquisition sitting there in the back pocket, uh, which uh, either makes uh, the transmission companies lazy or it uh, puts the fear into, uh, into the, uh, the customers? Uh, or is it just that we simply need to be adopting the best practices as we see the wind uh, farm community is adapting? Hi, Ken. Great question. Probably passed it, Andrew, for a practical view on this, but but my sense is best practice will get us a long way. Like the, 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 we've learned a lot from from wind, which I agree is is probably setting the setting the um, the benchmark for good engagement. Uh, the challenge is to lift to lift. Uh, uh, Everybody up to best practice on this, and to partly what we're doing through the um, transmission planning and investment review is building in uh, a, an opportunity for networks to recover costs for investment in social license early for transmission. That the the, um, the the challenge the the uh, the um, I think they have been reluctant at times to to or haven't been certain about whether they could recover costs of early investment for for social license, and we we want to send a very clear signal that uh, that you, that we need to um, 
that the investment is is critical to to getting it done. This look, sounds good. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd love to think that we are state of the state of the art, but you know, like any uh, any group of companies, right? There are there are leaders and maybe those that are, are less leading, and uh, it, you know, it really it really just takes one bad incident to really color the industry. So. Um, I think we all need to, you know, work together to be um, proactive in this space. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to change tack here a little bit. There's a question from online uh, from Anthony about how dependent is this clean energy transition on fresh water availability? Um, battery, rare earth, mining and processing, pumped hydro, green hydrogen, biofuels, all of this all needs lots of water, either being consumed or quarantined from other use cases. How can Australia ensure this does not become a constraint on our ambition? Um, sure, I'll take that. I, I guess the important thing to think about when you're thinking about the water uses is comparing it to the situation that we have at the moment. So at the moment we have coal-fired power plants and they're using steam, uh, of course. So they're heating up water, turning into the steam. Uh, a lot of the steam is going out the top um, so we're using a lot of water uh, in the current ways that we produce energy. So uh, certainly that needs to be considered uh, in terms of the energy transition, uh, but we're using a lot at the moment. Uh, the other things were mentioned were pumped hydro, for example. Pumped hydro, you're usually looking at a closed system, um, so you're circulating the water uh, round and round, so you're not actually um, using excess there. Um, so, yeah, all of these things have to be considered, but um, if you compare to what we're adding, what we're using at any rate, uh, it's, it's not a major consideration. But. Thanks very much. Did you have something to add, Andrew? I can say, <laughs> look, it's a huge concern for us. We, we have to make sure that we've got our water licences wherever we go, wherever we operate. And Bango Wind Farm, we had to truck a lot of water in, uh, and it was a real challenge. Um, so, you know, a lot of water in to make concrete. So it's roughly uh, two to 500 um, concrete mixes worth of concrete in every foundation which is a material operation you set up your own batching concrete plant there so um you know every developer has to have an eye on making sure they've got uh water licenses uh, in terms of like you know global consumption i'm sure we're not impacting in, impacting it in any great way but it's certainly a consideration for us i'm looking at fiona back in the audience here who i'm sure <laughs> there's plenty of uh, other information um anthony if you'd like to get in touch with her um, um we've got another question in the audience we might go right up the back to mustafa i think is that you thank you sorry not mustafa my name is peter on peter honorado i'm from the uh, climate diplomacy division of the department of foreign affairs and trade we really follow closely uh, all the work that comes out of ANU. I know I've got colleagues in the room and listening online. So thanks for putting this on today. My question uh, goes to some of the, the bottlenecks that have been discussed both by Frank earlier and the panel today, but honing on on workforce, I've seen some modeling around the energy workforce requirements for Australia to meet our, uh, our current commitments. Uh, and I'm sure those will be those calculations will be redone now. The capacity investment scheme has been enhanced um, and the government's, you know, thinking about the 2035 targets and beyond. So I'd, I'd welcome reflections from the panel about how we might address the, the workforce bottleneck for the energy transition. Thanks. Any takers? Sure. <laughs> uh, so I think one of the main things that we have to do is look at the existing skills we have um, and um, for example, the, the electrification uh, that involves a lot of households, a lot of buildings everywhere, and it's transitioning gas to electricity. And so a lot of that work, um, part of it can be done by plumbers. And so the, the opportunity is there is to train those tradespeople um, with the electrical skills to install the electrical part. So adding on to the skills that people already have I think is a is an enormous opportunity, but uh, at the same time, there needs to be a lot of training that's happening in in all sectors of the economy. Andrew, did you have something to add there? No. I always add. I can wax you're, lyrical you're all day your about <laughs> all these sorts of things, but yeah, we're massively um, staff constrained. Uh, just in our corporate offices, we've grown from like fifty to two hundred people this year, um, and I think for every person who sits in an office, there's probably got to be fifty of them outside helping build these things. So. 
Um, you know, it, it will be massively constrained in the, in the future. Getting good quality contractors is, is, is immensely challenging. And, you know, a lot of that's going to have to come from skilled migrants, I think. Um, and then internal pro and internal training programs. So there's going to be a huge need. Uh, and, and as I said before, at the end of my talk, we're not very good at forecasting what we can do in a year's time, but five years time, we're, we actually underestimate what we can do. So we do need to get training and it needs to be vocational training. It needs to be, um, you know, skills based. So laborers, concreters, um, uh, electricians, it's going to be a massive undersupply of electricians and then HV operators. Um, so yeah, we, we, we really sort of need to get back to basics almost on these skills. Uh, and um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'm sure there's lots of funding out there for TAFEs, but um, we would, you know, echo that is a really good place to go. Thank you. We have probably time for one more question. I can see Fiona's got a burning one. <laughs> I'm going to do that horrible thing where I say it's more of a comment than a question. Ah. But actually, this is a public service announcement. I learned about this the other day. There's a recent, very recent um, uh, a nationwide movement called Careers for Net Zero. Um, it was launched in October. Um, I heard about it uh, just a few days ago. So it's worth going and having a look at that because a lot of this conversation is, is reflected in that movement and looking at retraining, but also looking at education, um, a wider education um, for people re to realize that this is a glowing future, a green glowing future for, for your career, right? We need to get that message out that the energy transition is not a negative, it's a positive for people and um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite excited by what they're doing. So sorry to, to not have a question in there. I think that's a I wonderful just note. One little comment in response to your comment, Fiona. Uh, oh, no. One of the things we can tell young people, I think, is that this transition will happen within their careers. Um, so this is very exciting thing for people. Um, they can look, they can expect that by the end of their careers, we will achieve, have achieved this transition. So that's, that's a very exciting opportunity. That's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much, Kylie and Fiona, for the positive ending. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to thank you Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim, Kylie, Ruth and Andrew. And of course, for, all the, uh, for your presence here today, thank you for your time and your excellent questions. We will now break for 30 minutes. Um, light refreshments again outside in the foyer. 